right now on Ukraine. I just want to want to give you a, a few words of of caution if you're paying close attention, as many people are to this issue. If you are particularly uh, transfixed as part of the news cycle on what's happening over there. I started my career in the CIA Iraq office as an analyst. And what you may find uh, noteworthy about the history of such a position is that that was also an office or the CIA was certainly very much at the center of the storm around WMD in Iraq and those political debates and what was going to happen when we invaded Iraq and will we be greeted as liberators and, and all the rest of it, right? And here's what I can tell you, having spent time analyzing, years of my life analyzing and then even time in country uh, about Iraq and Afghanistan, there's always a lot of stuff you can't anticipate a lot of stuff you don't know and many things that will come out of nowhere and surprise people, even those who think they are the most well-informed, have access to the best information and so forth. I bring this up just because on this Ukraine conflict, it is very difficult right now to sift out what is meant for morale, perhaps, for one side or the other versus what is factual. There are memes and deep fakes and all kinds of things Flying around the Internet, it turns out, for example, that the Snake Island sailors who had that very amusing and stirring line about um, bleep you Russian warship, uh, they surrendered and were taken into custody. I don't even know if the audio was real or not, but the point is they surrendered, which I think was the right move under the circumstances, too. I just add that uh, they were completely outgunned on an island. They can't fight back. So what are they really going to do by fighting at that state? But the anyway, point being. There's a lot of information that's reported on that is not true and that ends up being either put out intentionally by one side as fake or Steven Seagal, for example, is not in fact fighting alongside, not that we ever said this, but is not in fact fighting alongside um, the Russians. And this did get out there. a bit. That would be amazing, by the way, if he had been. I mean, you know, his Aikido is pretty impressive, but uh, I, I think he's a little... Little uh, passes past his period for this kind of this kind of a fight, but yeah, no, it would be amazing. It would be amazing. Anyway, point being, he's not involved. So I just I just wanted to urge that note of caution. And and here's Clay. I want to turn this turn this to you because people keep asking me where do I think this is going? What's going to happen? No one knows, including Vladimir Putin, what this looks like in a week. So this is a this is a highly dynamic situation. There are arguments being made right now that the Ukrainians are just kicking Russian soldiers' asses all over the country, fighting much better. That may entirely be true. I'm just urging hold and wait before you come to conclusions because the narrative also starts to push policy decision-making. The narrative starts to be, oh, well, if only we gave more munitions or if only maybe we gave more training or did something else, we could push this thing to its terminus very quickly. You know, there's also the concern about Russian nuclear weapons. Clay, Everyone needs to watch this with a very skeptical eye in terms of the reporting. I'm rooting for the Ukrainians to expel the Russians. Obviously, people want Russia to stop this war of aggression. Fine. But there's a lot of reporting out there that turns out to not be true. No doubt. Here's what we know to be true. The Russian stock market is closed today. That's significant because of all the pressure that is coming to bear on an economic level on Russia based on sanctions that are being put in place. The ruble, the Russian currency, was down 20% in trading today. Interest rates over doubled from 9% in Russia to 20%. Uh, and just in uh, the, the last 30 minutes or so, the New York Times has reported that the World Cup, FIFA, is banning Russia from participating in the World Cup. This is significant because the World Cup is taking place in November of this year, and Russia was in the process of trying to qualify as a part of a European group, and several of the other teams that they were scheduled to play against said, we won't play against Russia while this invasion is going on. Okay, big picture question that I have for you, Buck. You've done so much of this game theory, strategizing, sitting down and trying to analyze where things go. If, if, and again, we stress if, if Russia is truly struggling, which there does seem to be evidence that they are in their efforts to take over 
uh, Ukraine, maybe more so than they anticipated, taking more losses, having heavier uh, resistance than they than they would have anticipated. Are you at all nervous that Vladimir Putin becomes enraged over being embarrassed and decides that he has to take this to the next level psychologically, trying to get into his head? In other words, a lot of people out there have heard, just, just take it outside of Russia and Ukraine. It's not uncommon, unfortunately. Two guys get in a fist fight. One guy gets his ass kicked. Sometimes that guy then decides to accelerate it by bringing a weapon, right? Bringing a weapon, a knife, a gun to try to get back over the ass kicking that he took in that fight. Everybody has heard and or seen a situation like that. Maybe you bring in other people to try to kick that guy's butt because you're embarrassed by what happened to you. You are the big bully and the big bully gets whipped. Are you at all concerned that Vladimir Putin in that analogy could be the big bully that is starting to get his nose bloodied and when that happens that he decides to accelerate rather than dial back the levels of aggression that he's committed so far? Yeah, I'm very concerned that what you're going to see is the frustration of this Russian blitzkrieg, and we've been using that term on this show, stretching back for weeks. That that was, a, and that is what we've seen. Uh, you could really call it a limited blitzkrieg. It was supposed to be very fast, overrun them using only a portion, though, of the Russian forces that had gathered around Ukraine's borders. Maybe about, you know, twenty percent or so, ten to twenty percent. And the frustration could become such that they decide to be much more severe. Right now, they're pretty much going. And again, I stress. We're relying. There are some people we're in contact with and we're seeing reporting from in Ukraine, which is very helpful. We're relying on very imperfect information. Ukraine's a very large country. There's fighting going on all over the country. So that's why people that have avoid simplistic narratives about what's going on with this is really what I was trying to tell you, because I've seen this play out before in other contexts. And that's what I'm trying to tell everybody listening. And I would I would say there may be a massive escalation in his willingness to have civilian casualties. There's already been dozens of them, uh, civilians killed, that we know of. But this could rapidly escalate. He wanted to avoid that because I think the strategy was clearly over on the armed forces, have them capitulate, have the have the Ukrainian government flee with its tail between its legs, install the puppet and then deal with the cons- like I believe that the Donbass region is now effectively by Putin considered Russian Federation. Well, that that is Russian soil. They've given out Russian passports. Now, the international community can say no to that. But look at Crimea. We didn't really do very much about that. What about everything between the capital and the Donbass region? I think they're hoping to seize critical infrastructure and create what they'll call a peacekeeping operation, even after they've started the war or some kind of stability operation pending negotiations with the central government where they have a gun to the head of the central government in Ukraine saying, agree to all these things while we have this area that's under our uh, de facto control. That's what I think happens. But Clay, to your point, I've seen reports that there have been a few thousand Russian casualties. That seems very high to me. That that seems not particularly credible at first glance. Again, I don't know. I'm not there and I don't have access to the to the high side, to the classified side anymore. So, you know, I'm just going on news reports like other people are. Um, but Putin on the on the caged or rather cornered Putin point, not caged, the opposite of caged on the cornered Putin point. This is a vicious guy who if you see what he was willing to do in Chechnya and you see the lengths he's willing to go to against his enemies, whether it's dioxin poisoning against a Ukrainian politician about a decade ago. Uh, the polonium poisoning of the Russian defector in the UK. Uh, th- there is a savagery that he will be willing to unleash here. I don't think he goes nuclear, but he also knows that's always in the back pocket and in the back of our minds. I don't think that will ever happen. I pray to God that will never happen. But a massive escalation of violence against civilians here to achieve his ends of control of Ukraine, that's what I think we could see in the days and weeks ahead. And I don't think everyone's psychologically prepared for that who's watching this, because right now it feels like the Ukrainians are just whooping the Russians. That's what that's the sense you get from the media. Another discussion I want to have, and I'll, I'll tee us up when we come back on this Ukraine situation. Is it possible that Vladimir Putin is becoming so weakened? And again, based on the fact that certainly Russia has not been able to rapidly take control over Ukraine. 
that in his homeland where there is a run going on right now on ATMs, where the ruble has collapsed by 20% overnight, where the stock market was not even able to open, is it possible that Vladimir Putin himself could be facing severe potential danger in his own country, dealing with his own power? Could this blow up on him in a way that maybe most of us did not anticipate because of the failures that he's seeing in Ukraine and the uniform response that we are now seeing from the rest of the world, so to speak, as it pertains to economic restrictions, in particular, Buck, on all of these oligarchs who are billionaires who are suddenly afraid, uh uh-oh, people may be coming after our assets in some of these other countries. How much pressure might we see there? I think that's a really intriguing question. The American public, despite the fact that Democrats are trying to in some way argue that Trump is still colluding with Russia, they've so committed to that narrative that they aren't willing to actually recognize that it's completely untrue. But the American public, as we said, 62% of them believe, according to a Harvard-Harris poll, that there would not have been an invasion of Ukraine by Vladimir Putin if Donald Trump was still in charge. And 59% of them believe that Joe Biden's own weakness helped to lead Vladimir Putin into this charge. We're going to talk about uh, whether or not Putin himself could be under trouble going forward. But Larry Kudlow from CNBC actually spoke out on what he believes would have happened if Donald Trump were still in charge and this situation in Ukraine had arisen. He did a really good job laying it out. I believe this buck was at CPAC, if I'm not mistaken, where uh, Larry Kudlow was making this uh, analysis and discussion. Let's listen. Trump would have said Thursday, I am ordering my energy secretary to accept and authorize these LNG export applications. I am ordering my interior secretary to open up all federal lands to drilling and production. And I will encourage our great fossil fuel industry to open the spigots, make as much money as you can, hire as many workers as you will, pay them high wages as you must. And that's how we will defeat Putin and Russia. That's what Trump would have done. Would have done things differently. That's for sure. And I think even the Democrats would have to admit it. It would have been very different had Trump been the president up to up to this point, given what we've already seen from Vladimir Putin. Uh, The issue of of energy and energy security in the energy sector, I think, Clay, is something that now people see much more clearly. You know, we had the rising price at the pump. We've. We've seen uh, the the Biden administration day one, literally day one of the administration comes in, cancels the Keystone XL pipeline. Why doesn't stop? And it doesn't think about this, everyone. It doesn't even prevent if you are a climate change worshiper, it doesn't even prevent that oil from going to market. It just means it doesn't come through the U.S. And it's not something that we have access to more easily and will be. Uh, as part of the export, they'll take it out west. They'll take it across Canada and sell, sell it to the uh, the Asian market uh, across the Pacific. That's the, that's the likeliest scenario. So it doesn't even save the planet if they believe that. But yet here is Jen Psaki, who instead of just admitting what Larry Kudlow said is true, wants to remind everybody, yeah, we just need to like take more bicycles and like more windmills. Play it. Energy <laughs> sanctions are certainly on the table. We have not taken those off, but we also want to do that and make sure we're minimizing the impact on the global marketplace and do it in a united way. I would say that the congressman's recommendations there, the Keystone Pipeline, was not processing oil through the system. That does not solve any problems. That's a misdiagnosis or misdiagnosis of what needs to happen. I would also note that on oil leases, what this actually justifies in President Biden. Biden's view is the fact that we need to reduce our dependence on foreign oil, on oil in general, and we need to look at other ways of having energy in our country and others. Exactly the wrong lesson. This is like what this is what Democrats do over and over again. We have we have they have shut down oil production in in as many ways as they can. The Democrats have. It was obviously stupid. And now they're saying, well, just use less oil. Find a way to do that. No, 
Yeah, when you can't actually find a way to do that. And we need to have this discussion too, Buck, because there is an unwillingness right now to cut off Russian oil. And until we're willing to cut off Russian oil, we're basically fighting a battle with one hand tied behind our backs because Vladimir Putin is still getting the opportunity to bring in all of the oil and gas money that he already was. And if we are truly going to ratchet up pressure to him to a degree where he may start to feel some significant political pressure in his own country, we have to have oil and gas also included in the sanctions.